We're, uh, you know, a little bit of sound technical difficulties never bothered anybody. But no. hey, good morning, everybody. I love the sound in this sanctuary. Greetings from the Lord. There's joy, there's fellowship. And I want to just continue to encourage that. Let me introduce myself. If we haven't met, my name's Honor. I'm one of the pastor elders here. And I get to be the first one to greet you uh, officially from Calvary Church Nampo. Just a, a warm welcome. And uh, if you're new or visiting, I want you to feel particularly um, welcomed here, and we would love to know you and find out what God's doing in your life. We do have a means for connecting, and if you would help us with that, there's something in front of you we simply call the card, and the card is a chance to just know how to be in touch, a chance to have a spot on the back for prayer requests, and if you take a little moment to fill that out, um, we're going to just get in touch with you with a request of, hey, if you want to get together, we're here, and we'd love to hear about what God's doing in your life, walk alongside you. So please feel free to do that, to connect with us, put in the offering plate when it comes by. Um, we do have a few things we want to just put in front of you as far as dates and activities and happenings that God is stirring among us, and we're thankful and worshipful to Him for how He does what He does. Um, but if you would, make sure that you've got a Calvary Weekly, and if not, you can uh, get one on the table in the back or holler, we'll, we'll grab one for you. Um, those are just things to know. So first of all, uh, a couple of dates. If you are a covenant member with us here at Calvary Church Nampa, we do have an upcoming family meeting. We want you to put that date on your calendar, Sunday, September 12th. Uh, that's our business meeting for those of you that we call our family meeting. We are family in Christ. Uh, September 12th, September, second time aside, and we'll, we'll meet together. Um, also want you to put a date on your calendar, September 18th. That is a Saturday. And we're basically going to use that as our transition point, kind of closing out our summer reconnect events and times to meet with folks in different ways and, and sort of thrust us forward into fall. And so what we're going to do is we're going to meet here at the church, have a fall cleanup day, and uh, just love on our grounds and our building. And we got some weeding to do, and, and we could really just kind of, you know, many hands make light work. So it's that kind of day. But listen. It's not going to be all work and no play. We want you to come together as a body. We would love for us to just take ownership of, hey, this is our place, our part in the community, and, and help keep it up. Uh, but we're also really excited to end that time for a, a, just a potluck fellowship lunch. So you can come for a little bit. You can come for the whole time. Even just come for the food. Nobody's going to shake your finger at you. We'd love to fellowship and kind of close out the summer with just a sense of celebration and togetherness. And so if you could, there's a, a paper up here on the reconnect board. Hey, I'd love to be there. Here's what I can bring to the potluck and start to get that organized. But Saturday, just make it a fun day and work in side by side as a special kind of fellowship too. So please come and be a part of that. The more the merrier and, uh, and we want you to be there. So that's that. Now, with that transition into fall, we want to make sure that it's out in front of you that we are going to get uh, community groups back up and running in September. And so we're ramping up, and right now we're in a phase of gathering information. We need to know who's going to participate. Maybe there's a night of the week that works best for you, how many people are, are involved in your case. And uh, just we have a survey for that. So if you haven't gotten a link that takes you to it, a Google Forms thing, you can let me or Sean know, and we can send it to you. Or if you're not in the links in Google Forms or whatever, check it out. Good old-fashioned paper. We've got it right here for you. It's just a couple of questions, truly two and a half minutes of your time, and you're clear. We've got some information to work with, and we can start forming forming up groups. And so we're really excited to do that. It really is one of the key parts of, of what it feels like to be a part of life at Calvary Nampa. Sunday gatherings are a great point to be all together, but we also endeavor to connect together more, um, authentically, and that's what those puzzle pieces up there represent. This is really focused on that. It's to build connections that go deeper than a high five or a hug on a Sunday morning, which we love. But then you get to be in discussion. We share a meal together. Uh, we spend time just in life and life on life. And then we do get in God's word. And we want to make that rich in our growth in the Lord. So please, um, we'd love everyone to participate. We're aiming at having three groups, maybe three different nights of the week. And really offer an opportunity no matter what your schedule might look like. So community groups coming up. Please um, just be, be excited and be prayerful about that. Pray that God would really prepare um, elements of growth and connecting to be good for our body. Um, so that is all of what we've got coming up that I want to mention. And really the last thing I want to just say from up front, and it's a way to lead us into prayer and 
preparing our hearts is, I just want you guys to hear this, that we are a, a neighborhood church, are we not? <coughs> We're nestled right here in this community. We want you to know that we need to think and pray as part of the community. And, and thinking along those lines, I don't know if you heard the news this week that there was a, a police shooting literally just across the street from our church um, on Thursday night. And I came into work Friday morning and saw the scene of uh, the police responding and all of that. What I want to put before you is we're going to pray together for our community right now. And, and this is one of those moments where you say, you know, why is there a need for light on this corner of Sherman and Almond, right next to the corner of Sherman and Banner? Why is there a need for the gospel to be preached? Because our neighbors are facing all kinds of things just like you. And that this is not a time to recoil in fear. Those of us who are in Christ have already died and been raised with him. There's eternal life. And when we face things that shake us, who's going to be the one to shine that light into the brokenness and into the darkness? God has this church here for a reason. I want you to just be thinking about being prayerful for our community. And uh, even if you had opportunity to, to be here and, and pray with a neighbor, I mean, we're the source of hope for this community, and, and it's been kind of rough this week. It was a kind of shocking thing to come into work, and we know it's kind of a public thing that the news you know, caught on to that, so our hearts hurt for that, and I just want to put that before you, help you to not fear, help you to know that we have a calling to carry the gospel right here in this community, and this is perhaps an opportunity for that. So, so let's be prayerful together. We're going to open not just with that. We are going to pray for our community. But preparing our hearts to celebrate the good God who steps into the darkness to come get us. Amen? Amen. That he came to the broken place, not afraid of our brokenness, so that he could redeem through his body being broken and his life being taken on behalf of ours. And that's the gospel truth that gives us the chance to be reconciled to the living God. Someone met that Savior, that Lord, Thursday night. And we should care about the fact that life has its start and has its end. And did that person have their chance or did they not? I don't know. But Lord, we pray. We want this to be a chance for us to be the ones representing that to everyone involved because this is the world we live in. Amen? Let's, let's bow our heads. Let's go before God. <coughs> Jesus, it is a, an incredible privilege that through your saving work and for those who turn from sin and let you be Lord and respond in faith to trust you for who you are, that there is a movement from death to life, that there is a gift of eternal life, that there is hope that cannot be taken or shaken. And together as a body, together as a neighborhood church, we feel the, the heaviness that this community feels, that, that our actual literal immediate neighbors may feel after a scary night. But Lord, I want to pray right now, and we want to join our hearts together to pray for them. That God, you would minister the kind of stirring, the kind of comforting, the kind of working in the internal thoughts that would draw them out of the fear and the concern and toward Christ. That it would be meaningful to them that they live in the shadow of a church who has people changed and carrying the good news of the gospel. Help us to recognize that we are that aroma of Christ for this community. So Lord, we just pray that you would do your comforting work, that you would stir here in special ways. And Father, as we turn to you for, for our community, pleading on their behalf, being intercessors for them, we recognize that right now, we have been given the gift of a special time set apart to slow our hearts and our thoughts, to feed them with realization of the truth and the reality of a God who loves us and who has come to seek and to save the lost, to redeem them, to, to show off your glorious grace. So as we transition into singing songs and praying more prayers and giving out of the abundance you've given us and hearing it from your word and all the elements of what it means to be together. Let it be gospel saturated. Let it be pleasing to you. Let it be filled with your spirit in such a way that we will have been ministered to by the living God. Built up 
and ready for living as missionaries in this community, disciple makers, as carriers of the gospel. Bless each soul that is right here with us and be magnified as we lift up the name that is above every name, the name under which and before which every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus, we declare your lordship right now come under you as your servants, grateful and full of gratitude for all that you've done. This is your time. Thank you for it. Bless it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Please stand and let's sing together in praise of our Lord.
I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, that my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him.
Truly, your name is holy, powerful. We love you. We want to know you. We want to relate with you. We want to hear from you. We declare that we need you. We need you to open the eyes of our hearts that we might know the hope to which you call us to. We need you to help us bear fruit that works. We need you to help us with spiritual wisdom. We need you, God, to make life richer and fuller and more alive than it could ever be without you on our own, struggling in our sin, left to our own devices. So in this moment, with the word of God before us, we believe it is your word, things you have uttered with intention, Power. I pray that we have hearts that are ready to receive <coughs> the truth and be shaped by who you are and what you're all about. I pray, God, for this body of people to be given a gift today. The gift of your reassuring love and the incredible riches of what it means to know. Bless this time in your word in special ways that only you can do. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, brothers and sisters, with a, with a shepherd's heart, I pastor here. I hope you know that. I do ache and pray for your good, your spiritual well-being. It's what I desire. I see God's rich and, and deep love, and I love you because that's how he loves you. And I hope to be useful in God's hands as an under-shepherd, under the good shepherd, to lead you and feed you and protect you as God would have in his design. I know where to lead you. I want to lead you to Christ. Because only he can lead us home. I know what to feed you. I want to feed you the nourishing truths of God's word. And I know how to protect you from false doctrines, from attacks from within and from without. That is the call of a shepherd. And I know that to protect you, we together, myself included, need the spirit of truth. God's word. To guide us, we need the authority of the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, we need sovereign guidance and protection from God the Father. We need God to be our rock and our refuge. As a shepherd, I think towards you with this kind of love and this desire. I know that some of the time, you, like me, look around and feel in this world as it is right now 
that you feel perhaps uneasy some of the time. Or like the psalmist here, perhaps you've been in distress somehow in your heart, that there is anxiousness and there are questions, that there is concern and there's confusion. I know that. I feel that too. I know, and let's be clear, that some of you are troubled about whether to take the vaccination or not. And I know that some of you are concerned for those who have, and I know that some of you are for concerned for those who have not. I, I know that some of you are worried about leadership in this country. I know that some of you look outside of this country, and you see a world in turmoil, and your heart feels angst. I know that some of you are wondering how to respond to government. Some of you are tired of the noise. I know that some of you see a culture in moral shambles and you wonder about the world that your children or grandchildren will be living in. I know that some of you feel heaviness even looking back and knowing that we're in a country full of racial tensions. Maybe some of you feel anger or weariness or indifference that that's even such a lightning rod. There's all kinds of things around us. Is there not the cause this kind of angst? uneasiness, perhaps distress. So as a shepherd, I, I want you to know that I selected Psalm 2 last week and Psalm 4 on purpose for you, for us as a body. Last week from Psalm 2, we learned this basic summary, that in a raging, in a rebelling world, God's Son is settled firmly on His throne. That all of us would do well to respond wisely to those facts. Now that psalm is a, a high level, a foundational truth that addresses sort of the scene as a whole. And it calls every person to consider seriously where they stand with that king of kings. That was our discussion last week in essence. And, and where that psalm was more general... Looking at things broadly, this psalm is more personal. That was a big picture. This one is individual. It's intimate. It's, it's what happens at home behind closed doors when things are quiet and you're sitting there just with your own thoughts in individual hearts. And both of these psalms, big and broad and general and here intimate and personal, both bring us and hold us to the gospel as central. So, this week, while well, last week we talked about this raging rebellion on this week, I'm going to let Psalm 4 now speak to us. In Psalm 4, we're going to see and explore this summary statement. This will divide out how we walk through the psalm together and let the text speak. Here's the summary statement. I think it will come up on the screen. Prayerful, tested confidence in God. In the midst of troubles, opens to us the gifts of true joy, and peace, and rest. I'll read it one more time, quickly. Prayerful, tested confidence in God in the midst of troubles opens to us the gifts of true joy, peace, and rest. If you here today belong to Jesus Christ... You should walk away today feeling like he has given you a gift for speaking what he has in Psalm 4 for us today. So, keep your Bibles open. We're going to be right at centered in that psalm. And follow with me as we unpack this summary statement and what the passage has to say. Let's begin with verse 1, where we're going to talk about this prayerful, tested confidence. This is a psalm of David, and David writes in verse 1, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Here in the beginning of the psalm, there is a call, is he not? Answer me when I call. He's crying out, and who is he crying out to? A helping God. 
So the first thing to note as we look at this opening is the psalmist calls out to God is that this is indeed prayerful, as our summary statement says. When he says, answer me, he's not being rude or demanding. Don't hear that wrong. He is instead, he has a heart desire based on what he's seen and felt and experienced. He has a heart desire that turns him to God and then calls out, not so much in this rude demanding, you have to listen to me or do something right now, but he's saying, please attend to what I have to say. He wants God to see to these things and to hear him. It's a call to be heard. To be heard not just sort of, but to be heard favorably. God would look with favor upon what he's dealing with. So it's like as if David is saying, Lord, hear my prayer right now. And we can tell that that's how he feels because he repeats at the end of the verse, hear my prayer. So when he says, answer me, he's not cornering God. He's saying, Lord, hear me right now. Please hear my prayer. And in fact, we can tell his stance before the Lord as we look at verse 1 and the second part of it. Because he doesn't just say, hear my prayer. He knows that it's an act of grace if God would stoop down and pay attention to his circumstances. Be gracious to me, is what it says. Do you see that? Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. God is being gracious to him. It's an undeserved kind of thing. But he's calling to God, not just prayer. That's certainly the act and the attitude of this psalm. He is in the moment, acting out and living in prayer right now. He's doing it. And it's also an attitude of prayerfulness. So it's not heartless, like dutiful prayer. There's a whole lot more infused into this. David, who wrote this psalm, reveals that there is emotion here. <coughs> the middle part of verse 1. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Now, that's distress from before. Did you see it's past tense? You have done this before. I have been in moments of distress, and apparently he's relating that moment of distress previous to what he's feeling now. So David is feeling things. He's uneasy or anxious or concerned, perhaps again, like we might feel in a world full of turmoil. And he must feel some kind of urgency because he's saying, answer me when I call. Like, there's a, a time element. He's saying, I'm calling now and I'm looking for response and I'm being heard. In fact, in a moment, we'll see in verse 2, he's going to say to a different audience, how long? How long? So, so there's urgency here. And this is the, kind of the elements of his prayerfulness. But notice two things. In the midst of this urgent, anxious kind of distress or concern, what is he doing? <coughs> the activity, the response is prayer. And there are many other alternatives of what we could do when we feel this way. The way we, we could get going and feed into the lathering up that our soul might feel, but he turns in prayer. And who is his audience? He says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. He knows who to turn to. He turns to God. It's not David saying, Joab, leader of my armies, I need you right now because there's something going on. It's not David saying, Zadok or Abathar the priest. Please counsel me in this moment. He knows that the living God has made the ear and therefore, of course, can hear and does hear. He knows where to go. He turns to God in prayer. And notice that this is prayerful attitude, but it is composed of a tested confidence. A tested confidence. In the middle of this, the verse... Verse 1, you have, in the past, I already know, you have built a resume with me of me being in distress and giving me relief when I was in that place. You have given me relief. It's past tense. It's recalling what God has done before. You see, when you trust God and he shows himself to be caring and involved and can do something about it, 
that builds a resume of his activity with you. And that backlog of things that God has done begins to be a place from which we can draw continued and forward-looking confidence. I know who you are and what you're capable of, God, and I'm going to continue then to lean on you and you alone. Does God have a resume with you? Have you given him opportunity to be the hero in your moments? Have you turned to him like this, and have you seen his hand at work? I hope so. I trust so, if you've been walk walking with Jesus very long at all. Perhaps, though, you would say, I, I actually am not super. There's no time like the present to open up your needs and your life to God and let him then respond and begin to build that with you. And to say, God, I'd like to see you at work in my life. Does God have a resume with you? This idea of giving me relief, one commentator, William McDonald, he says, God uses pressure to produce spiritual enlargement, spiritual growth. You see, what he's doing is he's looking at the verbiage, the original Hebrew, and literally, this verse might mean, in pressure, you have enlarged me. When he says, you have given me relief, he has experienced in the past a sense of things pressing in around him and turning to God. God has actually, instead of the pressure crushing and closing it all in, you have given me relief means you have opened it up. You have set me free. You have expanded me. You have enlarged me in the midst of that. And so McDonald can say, God uses pressure to produce spiritual enlargement. Don't be distressed about the fact that things feel like pressure around us. Because God uses that for you to be set free and opened up and grow spiritually in Him. Don't waste the pressure that God is putting around us and miss the chance to grow in Him. And so David knows he has tested. This is a proven thing that he's talking to the right one. And it's a confidence that he has when he says, Oh God of my righteousness, be gracious to me and hear. He's expecting, based on that, I'm confident that you're going to hear me and I'm going to tell you what I have to say. And here we go in this prayerful attitude. And he's calling to God, not just God, but God of my righteousness. Now what does that mean? It can be understood kind of with two parts to it. One of them may mean... You, God, are righteous. And so you're the God of my righteousness. He knows the justice of God, that he makes right decisions. He's turning to, to one who, who has righteousness completely and fully in his character. But I believe not only is he the one that does what is right, and therefore he's calling to him that way, but David knows he's the God of my righteousness. Where will I get any sense of rightness before God if it's not given to me by him. And so he leans on God even for his own goodness. That's the God he's calling to. He's asking that he's expecting in confidence, not because he's saying, I am godly, I am worthy, you must listen to me based on my goodness. No, he's saying, you're the God of my righteousness. And therefore I have confidence in the righteousness that you have and you have given me that then we can and should be heard before the living God. And you'll see in verse 3 in a moment, he knows the Lord hears him. He knows the Lord will hear him. I believe that as we enter into this prayerful, tested confidence, it mirrors very well what we are taught to do as New Testament believers right out of Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7. When you feel the anxiety, when there's the distress, when there's all these things, we are taught so clearly what to do. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, the God of our righteousness, the God who hears. And on the backside of that activity of prayerful, Tested confidence in God comes the promise of peace. The peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That mirrors the process of this psalm. You will see that the opening with all of the emotion built into it leads us to an ending where there is peace and 
rest and joy. So this is the prayerful, tested confidence that we see in the opening verse. And I want to use this moment to, to give you challenge number one. Challenge number one for you is endeavor to pray like this. Endeavor to pray like this. For my kiddos in the room, endeavor means to try. Put your effort into it. Where do we turn? Seriously, guys, let's think this through. Where do we turn? Do we let the scriptures model for us where to turn? Who or what do we believe? Now listen to this. Do we believe will really actually help and resolve and affect the problem or the situation around us? The source of the distress that caused our prayer in the first place. Do I turn to me? Thinking, I got this. I'll take care of this. Do we turn to a friend? Say, I, I, I got to talk to you. I, I need you. Um, can you make this stop? What should I do? Give me advice. Do we turn to some kind of an official in our lives, a principal of a school or a judge to take care of something or a leader that's been duly placed? Is that the first thought, that that's the place to go and we're in distress, saying this isn't good, someone needs to do something about it? Do we turn to family, your husband or your wife? And that's the first place, and you say, okay, here I am, and if I don't have you, then wife, family, brother, sister, cousin. Friends, do you turn to your pastor to be the audience for what you're hearing? Listen, I want to know and hear your, your heart. But all of these people are secondary under the first place to go, which is to turn to, oh, God of my righteousness. He must be our audience. He must be our confidence because of who he is and what he has done. So firstly and ultimately, who are you talking to and why? Do you believe this is really the tester for me? I don't know how it works for you, but I genuinely work my thoughts. Is it because I may not be sure that some ephemeral, unseen, I don't know if God actually can do anything about it? Maybe it's just sort of religiousness, and it's like, I don't know if that's going to be effective, functional, for what I'm facing. Do you really believe that God can and will involve himself, that he actually can be your source for help? So, perhaps some of us are prayerful, but we should caution ourselves to not have <coughs> just another anxious activity. If your prayers are a way of rehearsing what you're anxious about and just sort of more anxiety going out and it lathers you up all the more, there's something missing. The test of confidence. As you pray, express your heart. Tell God what you actually feel. But don't let that be at the end of a prayer going, Man, I just got my brain so full of all the things I've expressed, and you forgot to tell yourself who you're talking to, and that he's the one with a resume in my life, and I'm confident in him. If it's infused with that tested confidence, then the end of your prayer can be a place of, it's in good hands. It's in good hands. So prayerful tested confidence and as we're about to see, this is happening in the midst of troubles. That's the next part of our prayers. Prayerful test of confidence in the midst of troubles. Look with me. We're going to look at verses 2 through 5 now. He changes audiences. He was talking to God in verse 1. Now in verse 2, look at who he's talking to. Oh, men, you people, even maybe ones of high rank. Oh, men, how long shall my honor be turned to shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? In this change of audience, we realize, we get a little bit of a background, what seems to be causing the ache and the concern in the psalmist's heart. There's something about his glory being actively attempted to be turned to shame. What does that mean? Glory represents his reputation, his honor, and the honor of this personal situation. Notice in these first two verses how personal this is. Answer me when I call you, giving me relief, be gracious to me. I'm here before you, God, feeling something very personal. And the author of this psalm is saying, these ones are trying to take my reputation and bring it down. 
So they're using empty and vain words. They're running after lies. So this must have something to do with slander or attack or an attempt to undermine a reputation. This is David the king writing. Some commentators will connect Psalm 3 and Psalm 4 as though they may be a pair. And Psalm 3 tells us very clearly that it was when Absalom, his son, up, uh, rose up against him. Maybe David is in that time. We don't have clarity on the context exactly, but it could be. Regardless, David is experiencing a sense of, I'm being put under fire here. But he says to this audience, as though they were there, hypothetically, now I'm going to address you who are doing this kind of to me and at me. And he's going to ask the question, how long are you going to do this? Maybe out of a sense of his own age, but also, and this is incredible, he seems to be ready to address them helpfully. I want you to see where David takes this next. Pay very close attention to verses 3, 4, and 5. This is really remarkable. He says, these words are empty. They're vain. They're futile. You won't get anywhere because I know that God has established his plans. I'm not actually particularly worried about me, it seems. Now he seems to say, my worry is not for me. I'm worried about you, enemy of mine. He wants to advise them. Verse 3. Okay, you men who are doing this to me, you should instead know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And that the Lord hears when I call. As he begins to address his adversaries, he wants to give them helpful knowledge to say, Listen, God hears and he sees his own. God, when I call out to him, he will respond. He's involved with this. And for all who are godly, definition for you, godly here is this idea of like a, a Godwardness, like a living out towards him in, in in piety, in, in a heart for God. And ultimately, we're given a kind of godliness that only he can grant. But when he sees that, and David, in a particular way, set apart as a king, and when others, like us, are saying, my heart yearns for God, I'm in Christ, I'm just pursuing him, God has set them apart for himself in a special way. These are mine. You are his, friend. Brother, sister, and if you are his, the God who made the ear, he hears you pray. And this is good information for those who are against us because it can give them a bit of a warning to say, there will be and there is a kind of response. This will work out in God's favor and in the favor of his own. So he wants them, verse 3, to know something. He's trying to inform them. In verse 4, he wants them to consider. He wants them to consider. Read verse 4 with me. Still, still the same audience, the adversaries, the enemies. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Here's what you ought to do as you face this situation and I'm responding to it. I just would love to give you the advice. You probably should get along with it. And ponder. I love how one commentator said it. This pondering is like communing with your own heart or speaking with your own heart. Now, I don't know if you've experienced this, but generally people don't do this in groups. You know, we get kind of kind of puffed up and we're like, I'm with my guys. I'm not really thinking any deep thoughts, or if I was, I certainly wouldn't let that be known while I'm with the guys. Maybe some of you men can relate to that. But one way or the other, he's saying, listen, when you're home and it's quiet, you're there on your bed, you should be silent and you should listen to your heart and you should think this through. And the advice for you is, in your anger, and the word here can mean maybe not just like a, a fury, but it can mean like an agitation. It means to tremble, actually. In your trembling in this, whatever agitation it is that has caused you to try and stand up against me as an individual, but more than that, God and what he's doing, beware. Don't let this agitation lead you to sin. 
And this is advice for his adversaries, remember? Although it's biblical advice for all of us, is it not? You see, James will tell us that man's anger does not produce the righteous life that God desires. If you allow the agitation to drive, to own you, beware. But in that emotional state, don't let that lead you to make rash decisions, to say wrong things in wrong ways, or any other form of sin or attack. Ponder in your own hearts and be silent. That's the advice for the enemies. And it gets even more incredible than that. Because when he moves to verse 5, he's not just saying, know something. He's not just saying, consider something. He's saying, change you can have the opportunity to change. Offer right sacrifices, verse 5. And put your trust in the Lord. Is that not an incredible response to enemies who are trying to tear down my reputation actively right now? I have turned to God and who and, and, and what he's about. And in the meantime, my focus has moved from myself to them in concern for what are they going to be doing when they stand before the Lord. And I know that he has a heart to redeem and to bring them in. I know he wants to be trusted. And so I will, in this hypothetical advising to my audience, say, you should learn to offer right sacrifices. Not in proper worship of self or idols or power or whatever it is. You should submit to this God. You should learn his ways. And you should put your trust in him. This is a call to the enemies to throw up the white flag and to give in and say, the Lord reigns. The sooner you realize that, the better it is for you. Come be a part of this. And suddenly, the priority of them and their heart and their change overtakes David in his personal situation. It's not so much about him. And can I say to myself, and can I say to you that in these conflicts and all the things that surround us, it's not so much about you. It may be about them and their opportunity to take the, the activities that are so against and yield and cease from that and turn to the Lord and trust him. So challenge number two. If challenge number one was endeavor to pray like this, then challenge number two is endeavor to treat adversaries like this. Kids, defining terms if you're listening, an adversary is like an enemy. Okay, somebody who's against you. And we can ask ourselves, do I desire to see those opposed to me come to the knowledge of the truth? Am I willing, if given the opportunity, to explain it to them, as David has attempted to do here? And I'm going to challenge you right now to think of those that you, in this very moment, would consider an adversary for any reason. Maybe a leader you disagree with, the boogeyman at the helm of some organization that is destructive, scheming in the background, somebody who thinks about masks exactly opposite as you do, or doesn't carry the same stance. I want you to think about this because you may feel opposed and you may feel their opposition against you. But when you picture this person, maybe there's a name, maybe there's an organization, I want you to consider, would you be willing to say to them and help them see Christ? Have you ever prayed for the good of that person? Would you ever? Who will? Would you invite them to put their trust in the Lord, as David has done here? Because if they do, that means you're saying you can come into this that I live in, this, this family in Christ, and these benefits. I'm inviting you in to join in with me. And friend, it may be that they can be converted from their sin and convicted of things that are wrong, but it may not be that they're going to be converted to your point of view, but they will have put their trust in the Lord and therefore are part of the same thing as you. You see the irony of that. You see the difficulty of that. I challenge you 
to endeavor to treat adversaries like the scriptures are demonstrating for us right here. Now, we see this prayerful, tested confidence. That's what's going on. We see that it is indeed in the midst of troubles. But we found a surprise in how David responds toward that. Oh, but look at where it takes us. When we have this kind of prayerful attitude, we take things to the Lord. When we recognize the environment that we're in, and we do have the confidence, the trust in the God who hears, like David here, look at where it takes us. We're going to look at the last verses, verses 6 through 8. And here we see that this kind of confidence opens up to us the gifts that can be yours of joy and peace and rest. See, I believe that God, in writing this psalm, the Holy Spirit authored it through the work of his servant David, inspired, God breathed, that God wants to give you a gift today. He wants to hand you something that may seem like Compared to others around, it's not even fair that I could like sleep well at night and have joy in my heart and everything feel truly, richly okay. But God wants to give you that kind of a, a space within which to operate right now in our world for all of its turmoils and bubblings and latherings and all. And I want to give you this gift today. I want to show this to you. First, he says, there are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. Now I'll just admit, I wasn't sure the attitude in verse 6, whether there's a little bit of a cynicism there. Like there's a lot of people saying, well, who can help us? And Come on, God, do something. That might be a way to read that verse. But the more I studied, I got convinced that David's not saying there's a lot who have this cynical view towards the Lord. I think he's saying there are many others around us. Who are saying, who can help us? Who could show us some good? And they are joining just like you. You're not alone in your pursuit and your belief that God can. And they also are saying, Lord, our prayer now is that you lift up the light of your face upon us. There are others like that with you. There are many, in fact, says the scriptures. So as we think of the... The activity of this kind of prayerful confidence in God, others have it too, and it's good to be around in community to receive that and spur it on at one another. And as David responds, and he's entered into prayer from an angsty place in verse 1, verse 7, he is saying, you have, this is past tense, I've experienced this, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. More. The very best times in life. Harvest time. Everything's full and rich and we've got lots. The very best that the world has to offer. The times of celebration when it seems like, like the abundance is just all around and there's no worries in life. You know at this time, harvest was a rich time of celebration in Jewish culture. Dances and meals and times together to celebrate that God has blessed and everything. We've got this coming in. But he's saying there's a they. Those who have not yet put their trust in the Lord. They're, they're staying out there in opposition to this king that I've learned to submit to. And in their very best, they've got nothing on the joy of the Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than that. I like how Albert Barnes says it. He says, he had more real happiness in the conscious favor of God than the greatest worldly prosperity without that could afford. Religion, well, and by religion he doesn't mean religious activity, he means relationship with God. Trust in Christ will, in times of trouble, give more true happiness than all that the world can bestow. You have access as an adopted child of God to a rich store of His grace that enters you into a place of joy. Amen. Real joy. You know how many people are out there wishing that they could find something that feels like joy? Real joy? 
Oh, but you've been given it in Christ. So first, there is this gift of joy, and he's like, man, I have experienced this. I have lived this. I've been in caves with people chasing after my life, and I'm singing songs because I trust my God, and I'm okay, and he's got me. I have maybe my own son in rebellion against me, trying to tear down my honor and take away my kingdom, but I'm praying to God, and he's hearing me. And he's strong, and he's good, and he's the God of my righteousness. I'm good. That's joy. That's deep joy. Not just light surface happiness that today was a good day at work. No, this is the kind that's rooted deep beyond experience and founded upon the goodness of God. Secondly, not only does he have this kind of joy, but in verse 8 he says, In peace, in peace will I both lie down and sleep. Joy and a peace. Isn't that the exact opposite of the turmoil we were describing at the beginning? The waves of the sea tossing to and fro, and everything seems like it's out of control. And this person, a person of God, writing in the inspiration of the Spirit, says, you know, I've actually found a place in the midst of it all where I can just be at peace. Does anybody remember the time when Jesus was traveling with his guys, and a storm just comes out of nowhere. And they're saying, Jesus, don't you care that we drown? Like, this is bad. Except they had to wake him up. <laughs> because he was laying on the pillow, and he was at peace. There is such a thing as laying calmly at rest in the truths of who God is and what he's given to us that gives us this kind of peace. And in fact, third, it's not just this joy and this peace. He's saying, you know what, in this, I will, I know that I can actually literally lie down in my bed. I don't have to be pacing all night long. I don't have to be sitting up in my chair, wrenching my hands, what if, what will be. I can lie down. It's time to put that down. And not only just lie down, it's not just lie down and bend the eyes over it. <laughs> We're visiting all these things in our thoughts. I will both lie down and I will settle myself physically into a place of rest and I will sleep. And here's why. Because, based on the reasoning that you, O oh Lord, over heaven and earth, you alone, no other alternative, not my pastor, not my leaders, not my friends or my family, you alone, O oh Lord, you can make me well, stay, live, and see. There is such a thing of resting under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, in which we can say, it's going to be okay. He's got me, and I'm not in any true danger. Because the Lord of the resurrection has got me. So, I don't know if you think about your sleep like this, but, but it occurs to me that there is such a thing that the process of closing down a day, that sleep itself can be an act of confidence in God. That your sleep is an act of faith. You say, at the end of the day, Lord, whatever else may be done or undone, whatever else may be pending for tomorrow, my Lord Jesus taught me that tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. Today's done. There's no more room for this. And I put all of whatever's left down at your feet. I trust you. And I want you, in this trust, to let me be free. To, to say that you've got it. And I will now sleep. I will rest. Sleep can be a way that you actually get to show God one more time at the end of the day, I trust you. I love you. We often try to help our kids through this in times of prayer, closing down the day. Okay, put that down. The day is done. Tomorrow will be more and he will meet us with everything we need when we wake in the morning. Trust him. I like how Barnes says it. He calls it a calm confidence in God. A calm 
own confidence in God. And I believe, friends, that theologically, we can see the, the rooting, the, 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 the footing that we stand on, that these gifts of this joy and this peace and this rest are ours in Christ. The gift of freedom to live a whole different way and to be operating under a whole different paradigm because we've been brought into a kingdom that's a different kingdom with a king who sits firmly on his throne. That is given to us through entering in through Jesus Christ. Consider Romans chapter 5. I think I have the, the verse to put up there. <coughs> Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, because since we have been justified by faith, by the God of my righteousness, and I'm trusting him, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has given me access that the living God who is just and right in all his ways and will deal with these things, I'm actually now entered into a place where he's okay with me. And sin, which was a point of rebellion and, and pushing away of God and enmity with God, that now has been put away by the cross. Jesus died for the death that you should have died for your sin. And so through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. And then it continues saying, through him, still through Jesus, he's the access point. We also have obtained, gained access by trust, by faith, into this grace in which we now stand. There is a place on the other side of the door that Jesus said he was. I am a doorway through which you enter into the goodness of God, with a relationship renewed in him. Through that now we stand and we have a space within which to operate, which is the grace of God. And look at the, the tone of it. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There is more joy in my heart living in this place that Jesus has bought for me. He paid the price, my entry fee, and now I stand here. Friends, I want you to see the gift that God has given you. He didn't just save you from sin. He brought you in. And the riches of grace, I mean lots of things that are now benefits to you because of Christ. They are yours. So you can unapologetically say to a watching world, you know, you really should put your trust in the Lord because I'm living over here in this place and it's a great place to be. I feel Amen. joy in the midst of this trial. Amen. I am at peace in my heart. And in fact, Jesus helps me rest well at night, no matter what. So what's the third challenge? I challenge you to pray like this. I challenge you to treat your enemies like this. Thirdly, I, endeavor, I challenge you, endeavor to receive these gifts of grace. Give yourself the, the right and the option to have them be yours. I can live and operate within that. And that's why I hope and I pray that this psalm will feel like a gift to you. When I walk out here, God gave me a place for me to live. It is so great. So full of joy and peace. Perhaps as we find this kind of incredible and deep peace, even literally sleeping well in the midst of turmoil, perhaps from this place of a sober and calmed mind, maybe then we can be better outfitted to take on or leave alone the things of pressure of the world around us. But we're better equipped from, from this place of trusting God. I want to ask you as we're closing this up, did you know, did you know that biblically when we do all things without grumbling and disputing, <laughs> That this actually helps us by keeping us blameless and innocent. It keeps us from being angry and entering into sin. Do everything without grumbling and disputing. I'm quoting from Philippians 2, by the way, if you want to go check me on it. And not only that, it makes us stand out as forgiven children of God in the midst of a crooked and a depraved or perverse generation. And that in this context and in this way, it causes us to shine as lights in the world. Your lack of complaining, grumbling, disputing, your, your operating from a place of peace and rest will be so different 
on the backdrop of the worries of the world, that he will shine like stars against this crooked and perverse generation. I think this is just a wonderful place to be in a world that feels and is as it is. That God has got this. And I want to end with this, the words of a song that I wish I knew the backstory on how or why they wrote this. It sure sounds like it's fueled by Psalm chapter 4. What a friend we have in Jesus. I invite you to close your eyes, and I'm just going to read the words of this psalm. And I want you to track along with it. I mean, hum it if you want as we go. <coughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace. Jesus, we are grateful for your goodness. We are in awe of your attention to our needs, to our prayers. I pray that we would learn to be a praying people in everything. I pray that we would be a people concerned for even those opposed to us, and that they might find what we have found. That in their rebellion, you have come for them, just as in our rebellion you chose to demonstrate your love for us, that while we were still sinners, you, cried, you died for us. Help us make that known to others. Jesus, what a gift to live in this kind of joy and peace, even when it seems that no one should have that right, because everything is crazy, and yet you sit on your throne, you have high-level control over all things. And down to a personal level, you are hearing us and attending to our prayers. And you have done it before, and you'll do it again. That you'll give us relief in our distress. I pray that when people in this audience this week catch themselves in angst and concern and worry, that they would quickly and heartfelt way Turn to you in prayer, and I pray that you would, by your promise, return to them the gift of a settled heart, calm mind, deep joy in the fact that they can have such benefits. <clears throat> and may that be a practice of ours as a church. May that be something that shines out against the backdrop of the world as it is right now. Thank you for this time before you, and trust that you're hearing us even now. In Jesus' name. Do you feel like maybe God's given you a, a gift of something to live in and enjoy and live? I have, and I hope you do. Now we're going to turn to the Lord's Supper, and, and in that change of, of what we're doing, in reality, we're not abandoning what we've been talking about all along. The, the access to this gift, or these gifts of grace, was blood bought. What benefits you have as a follower of Jesus Christ was pricey, bought with the precious blood of the living God manifested in His Son, Jesus Christ. We do well to regularly remember that.
we do well to not forget what the cost of our freedom in Christ was. So, this is going to be that moment where you are going to have your own opportunity. I can't live it out for you to, to grab the moment and make it fresh and real and personal. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, walking in obedience with him, you always have an invitation to the Lord's table to do as he said, to remember his cross, his death, and to proclaim that through the act of bringing into your very self, saying, Jesus, I need you infused in my life. There's no magical elements in these trays before you, but they are, in a very powerful way, Christ. Not his actual flesh, not his actual blood, but friends, there's mystery here that Jesus is saying, you need me. So keep infusing me into your life. And although they're representative elements, let it be real that you are indeed taking Christ deeply into your heart and life today and as you go to his word and how you live out your week. So, I just want to invite you to let this be kind of one of those quiet moments, those calm moments, like the psalmist calls you to be pondering your own hearts. If it seems as though, God, something's kind of tangled in my thoughts, and I, I'm unsettled here, and it's not right before you. These are times to sort that out and, and to come in confession in your own heart and say, God, you know, my words this week were way out of line. Hey, God, you know, what I, the harshness with my wife or the interaction with my coworker or whatever it may be that, that has tripped you up this week, recognize that there's penalty for these wrong things. Jesus took it. So you can confess and then wash you fresh and clean today. I'm inviting Christians to this table, and some of you may say, I don't, I don't really know what it means. I might feel like I'm in a Christian culture, but I don't. What you're talking about, this kind of trust in Jesus at a deep level, I haven't given them that kind of place in my life. I want to tell you two things. One, I want to tell you that it's, it's a good thing to just let this moment be for those who've experienced the forgiveness of Christ and are walking with Him like I've been describing. And don't come. Don't, don't make it a Thing where you feel like you just sort of should because it's a small room and people might notice. We set you free from that. We just want to kind of call it what it is for you. But much like David, I want to advise you to know that the Lord has set the godly apart from himself. He does hear when you call, but you should be aware not to let things lead you into sin, and you should be pondering in your own hearts in that. Please, there is such a thing as offering right sacrifices and putting your trust in the Lord. This time can be a time for you to consider all of that and say, do I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today? Am I willing to put down my arms of rebellion against him, to stop pretending like what I'm doing is okay, and just to call it where it is in repentance, and then belief and say, I'm going to trust you. I want this. I want joy. I want peace. This would be a great time for you to explore those things. You could, right now, without any guidance from anybody else, tell Jesus those things in your heart. And he would take over your life. He would make you a new creation. Being saved from sin, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. I invite you to use this as a time for introspection. And if you need to talk with me or Butch afterwards, please come find us. We'd love to discuss these things. So here's what we're going to do. Logistics. Music will play. You have your time. I'll be quiet. When you're ready, at any time, that your heart is prepared, come to the middle aisle, come down, receive the elements. There's two cups, they're stacked, so we don't have to get in and out of a tray of little bread pieces. So take them both, back to your seat around the side, and on your own, when you're ready, you take that little wafer, and you commune with the Lord, and you remember that he said, this is my body, which is really good. You remember, through the act, his death for you. And then you take the juice, and you stare at it for a moment and see how red it is, and let it remind you that he poured out his life. And you do as he said. You do this in a moment. So you can take that when you're ready.
at the end, I'll come and I'll end us with a prayer. We're going to lead out in a song and enjoy the rest of what God's given us for our time. Okay? This is your time. Let's enjoy it before the Lord. For those who need to know, there's a gluten free option in the middle. I want you to be.
promise is the Lord turning his face in faith. It means his kindness toward us and his life toward us, not his turning away, which means his wrath and his disfavor. So I want to leave you with a benediction from the book of Numbers, often said that under that favor of the Lord is where we want to live. I'm going to send you out with that to be centered on these truths and to live well for him. This is from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go live in the gifts of his joy and peace and rest this week and offer it to anyone who is willing. Have a great week. We love you guys. Greet one another. Meet someone. Have a, have a good afternoon. We love you.